welcome to the Fish Breeder Show, a webcast covering the how-to in the breeding and raising of tropical freshwater fish. I'm your host, Tim Stanton. And I'm Jeremy Bosch, and today we are discussing the breeding of cichlids, in particular New World cichlids. Mm -hmm. and now this is an episode in a larger series on the breeding and raising of tropical freshwater fish. As in any journey, uh, there's many paths to the same destination, and the same is true with uh, the raising and, and breeding of tropical freshwater fish. And future shows will actually cover uh, tropical fish species such as barbs, tetras, old world cichlids, catfish, loaches, and who knows what, el what else we'll come up with. We may have some other things up our sleeves too. Yeah. Uh, cichlids themselves are part of the perch family. Uh, they're awfully often separated based on their behavior, their parental care. Uh, more okay. on this in a little bit later. Um, cichlids are kind of hard to define as far as what they are, but they're typically cylindrical in shape. Uh, they have a two-part lateral line, typically have a tentanoid-shaped scale. Um, they also have other structures within their body that make them uh, different than other fish species, uh, such as a structure in the head of the fish, too. Right. So when we talk about New World uh, cichlids, uh, these are cichlids that are typically found in Central and South America. Those cichlids are found in Africa, parts of the Middle East, even into Asia. Uh, all cichlids are found in uh, tropical to subtropical conditions. And uh, the furthest uh, south the uh, uh, New World uh, cichlids are found is, is uh, Uruguay and Paraguay. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest reasons people get into cichlids is for one reason, because they show parental care. Uh, a lot of people can relate to how the fish take care of the offspring. So um, all forms of cichlids show or exhibit some sort of parental care. Um, species, some species will even stay with their young until they die. In the case of the, um, the large emperor cichlid from Lake Tanganyika, Bolingochromus microlepis, pretty neat species of fish. Yeah, interesting. Um, now there are other such uh, as the variety of tilapia. Some are uh, uh, pretty primitive in their care. They uh, lay their eggs, they guard the eggs uh, or fry for a few months, and then the juveniles are on their own. Uh, some species even go through uh, mouth brooding behavior where uh, one or both of the parents incubate the eggs actually inside uh, their mouth. The uh, fry will hatch inside the mouth and actually live there uh, for a number of days or weeks based upon the species in, in uh, a discussion. Uh, mouth, greening, mouth brooding itself is seen as the most advanced form of breeding within the cichlid families. Uh, their parents would literally exchange fry back and forth from one parent to another. Some amazing video you can find on YouTube and other sources. Uh, people make whole movies about cichlids, uh, write whole books. Uh, they're very fascinating species, and a lot of people really get smitten with them. Uh, the In terms of uh, uh, what those fry live off of, it's the nutrients uh, that uh, the parents have, and they're most commonly uh, uh, sometimes even feed off the, uh, the mucus on the fish bodies, uh, and this is common to a New World cichlid uh, called the, the discus. Uh, and uh, even pike cichlids uh, exhibit some of that behavior as well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a unique form of parental care. Mm -hmm. And as far as the setup for a cichlid tank, it's, it's hard to say. It depends on the species of cichlid that you're keeping. Um, here we're discussing dwarf cichlids. Dwarf cichlids in general can be kept in smaller aquariums, uh, typically anywhere from five-gallon tanks for uh, species we're talking about today, the epistogrammas. Uh, shell dwellers uh, from Lake Tanganyika, um, like the Neolamprologus uh, um, multifasciatus can be kept in small tanks. But there's also some larger species like Bonitochromus and Pelvicochromus from West Africa, which get a little bit of size and a little bit of um, aggression, so they need a little bit larger tank. Um, and then larger cichlids may require, you know, 50 gallons plus, especially when you're talking about the, the big bruisers from like Central America yep. or some of the large uh, Malawi cichlids, for instance. All right. And I think one of the things that uh, the audience need to keep aware of if they've not had any background with cichlids is they're not a, a schooling fish uh, or uh, uh, one that's going to hang out in a large community. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the keys to keeping uh, cichlids and other territorial fish is to keep them uh, uh, in such a large tank where they can have their own territories. And this includes uh, 
because they are territorial fish, providing them with visual barriers to, so the fish themselves can then sort of map out their own little uh, lines, their own little Mason-Dixon lines inside the tank. Uh, and then uh, this provides that structure with, in the form of plants, uh, live or fake, uh, rocks, driftwood, leaf litter, those types of things that are important to fish that sort of differentiates their territory from another person's territory. Um, now keep in mind though, uh, you're going to have to do some research because some cichlids uh, eat plants. Uh, some cichlids like to move rocks uh, with their heads and so they'll sculpt their own little territories around like that. So if you have a substrate that you think you're going to keep nice and, nice and smooth, make sure that uh, when you check even some of these New World cichlids that they're not ones that are going to move uh, your dirt and gravel around uh, with their bodies or heads or tails, that type of thing. That's um, a good point too. Yeah. and. Um, uh, one of the other things that's also unique about uh, New World cichlids is high pH uh, because of the, the region from the, the world that they come from, uh, they're going to want a high pH. So uh, rocks that have higher mineral content are going to work great, uh, while other cichlids prefer uh, rocks that don't have uh, uh, altering of pH capability. So do a little research before you uh, uh, purchase those cichlids uh, from the New World and uh, put them in your tank. Very true. And then we're also discuss the diet of cichlids. Um, cichlids are very diverse in their diets too, so uh, hard to pinpoint on that. But as far as what they typically eat, usually insect larvae, aquatic crustaceans like Daphnia, or even larger crustaceans um, like shrimp and and uh, whatnot. Insect larvae, um, insects themselves like ants uh, going into the water. Plant material, other fish, algae, detritus—you pretty you pretty much name it. And there's a cichlid that will eat it. Um, right. Even snails, for instance, will be consumed by some of the cichlid species. Uh, it's important to do research, as Tim was saying, not only for tank setup but also for diet, so you know what the fish are going to eat. Right. And uh, since there's so many New World cichlids, uh, we're going to uh, take uh, this episode and focus in on one species in particular, and that's going to be the Pistogramma unatus. Uh, the, it's a dwarf cichlid uh, found throughout South America, and uh, they are the largest genus of any of the groups of cichlids uh, uh, in the New World, with uh, described species of over 50 and the number of undescribed species is nearly three to four times that number, meaning zoologists haven't had the opportunity to actually uh, classify all these remaining uh, species they've identified. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of research uh, on the way and when, uh, when it comes to this group, and uh, check all your uh, fish hobbyist magazines for all the new uh, species that will be introduced. Uh, and this is even going to include uh, mouth brooding uh, species within this genus. Very interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, uh, Epistogramma they're going to find and probably discover, I mean obviously it's the largest genus, but there's new discoveries made all the time regarding this group of fish and it's um, certainly within South America as far as the cichlids go, it's probably the number one group of fish that are currently studied, so a lot more okay. to, for the genus to, to discover, so looking forward to see what else is discovered. Yeah. Well, Epistogramma you notice comes from Peru. Uh, there are several different color forms of this fish. It's a medium-sized dwarf cichlid. Males will attain a little under um, three inches. The females remain right around two inches in size. Um, I found that they do quite well even in a small tank like a 10-gallon aquarium, so you don't need to have a large tank for these guys. And you want to outfit it with a, like a sponge filter or power filter, something simple, something easy to maintain. Uh, water temperature. I found anywhere from 74 to 82 suits these guys fine with a temperature right around 76 to 78 being ideal. Uh, the tank itself, these guys are cave brooders, so a lot of caves work really okay. well. Um, so driftwood, uh, pleco caves that are typically used for the blacostomus work well for, for these guys. Um, even some of the references, they use film canisters for the, the babies to, okay. for the uh, females to lay their eggs in. So. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, those are the types of things you're going to look for all the uh, the leaf litter, uh, have all that set up, yeah, and then you want to introduce the uh, the group of four to six fish, and uh, they'll live uh, quite well. It's a, a harem setup uh, to spawn where it's a male breeding with as many females 
uh, that are willing. Uh, keep in mind that there'll always be a couple females that that are uh, not going to participate in breeding behavior. So therefore, having that harem set up is going to work great uh, in terms of production. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy himself, he's had as many as four females protecting their clutches all within the same tank. So very unique experience uh, from Jeremy's standpoint. And for raising up the fry, I mean, it's going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, use baby brine shrimp. They'll take that right away. And brine shrimp is a great way to provide nutrition for the baby fish um, in a small package. We've discussed that many of times. Uh, most of the nutrients that the fish require, they'll gain from the baby brine. And, um, you know, basically you want to make sure that you don't overfeed the tank just like any other fish species. But uh, pretty easy to, to maintain this, this fry on, on baby brine alone. All right. So, Jeremy, for yourself, when you feed the adults, do you typically do a pellet? Do you do live foods? What's your preference with uh, adult epistogrammas? Yeah, usually with the adults, I use insect larvae, mosquito larvae, uh, bloodworms, glassworms. Um, they'll take uh, somysis shrimp, uh, brine shrimp, baby brine, um, daphnia you know, work really well. So a variety of frozen foods typically. They will eat some pellet foods as well, but they really seem to... Um, be specialized in eating the um, small aquatic uh, lar insect larvae. Right. This seems to be the main part of their diet. And, and for viewers that have watched previous episodes, one of the things that we've emphasized is uh, making sure the fry, fry are provided with an environment with uh, plenty of good fruit and good water quality. And that's going to be the keys to a, a good uh, growth rate on the fish. They get the full color and uh, then you can start introducing them to larger tanks or back in with the adults as appropriate. Uh, so make sure you keep those frequent water changes coming. Do those frequent feedings, even small amounts on a regular basis is better than one large feeding uh, once a day. And uh, uh, that's really going to help uh, them grow out. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yep. You know, we want to thank our resources today for some of the information that was provided. Um, the Bench Photo Atlas 1 through 5, the actual volume 1 through 5, was a great resource. I highly recommend that book to anybody that doesn't have that. Yep. And then also the Dwarf Cichlid Atlas by Uwe Romer. Um, there's actually two of those. There's volume one and two. Those are great resources for Epistogramma if you want to learn more about these yeah. fish. And these are and these are also books because they are atlases. They're they're very critical books in the fish hobbyist industry. You find them even at your uh, library. So if uh, you don't have a, a fish store that's selling them, uh, find them online uh, or go down to your library, and uh, they're likely to be there. And they're an excellent resource, especially when you start looking at what's the right substrate, what's going to be the compatibility of, of epistogrammas with other fish if you want to introduce them into a, a community tank with some of the fry once you want to know what to do with them. Uh, it's going to be a great reference. And on that note, uh, let's uh, thank you for watching. And on behalf of Jeremy, uh, I'm Tim Stanton, and happy fish keeping to all. Thank you. Thank you.